Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thank you, Global Patties, and thank you, Sherry. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support, and you know we'd rather get right to talking about beekeeping. However, our super nice sponsors are critical to help making all of this happen. From the hosting fees to software, hardware, microphones, recorders, they enable each episode. So with that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more in our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor Kirsten Trainer and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com. And that is with a number two. Also, check out Two Million Blossoms, the podcast, available from the website or from wherever you download and stream your shows. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're really, really happy you're here. It's almost Christmas time. Hey, Kim, how you doing? Doing okay. It's still, uh, I say this carefully, summer here. Uh, wow. 40s and, you know, 30s and 20s at night, but 40s, sometimes 50s during the day. This is not a bad way to spend December. <laughs> well, that sounds like a typical December in, in the Pacific Northwest, other than um, the amount of rain we've been getting. I, I, you know, I can't believe it's December already. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Speaking of December and the approaching holidays, did you get my Christmas wish list? You know, I missed that somewhere. You know, everyone tells me that. <laughs> I... I got to check my email program. Yeah. Everyone tells me they haven't seen it. I haven't seen it, Jeff. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll try it again. Uh, I'll, 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 maybe I'll look this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, check your spam folder. It might be there. Coming up, we have a special visit from Ed Colby. Yeah, Ed. You know what Ed did? Um, working with the people at at uh, Northern Bee Books, Ed has gone back over all of the, I, you know, Ed's been writing for Bee Culture Magazine for, I don't know, 10, 12 years. He started when I was there, and uh, I kept, I convinced him to keep going. And what he's done is he's gone back over 10 or 12 years, and, and he's looked at all of the columns that he wrote, and he has now recorded them. And mm. and uh, he, not only that, but Northern Bee Books put them in a book so you can get all of the whole collection, but he's recorded the ones he likes the best. And as I understand it, you got one of those today. Yes, I do. Directly from the Western Slope of Colorado, let's listen to Ed Colby. My sidekick, Marilyn's niece, ended her career as an extreme skier when she broke both legs jumping off a cliff at a snowmass competition. We attended her May wedding near Taos, New Mexico. Galena married, of course, a kayaker and Telluride ski patroller. Her father rode her to the ceremony on the banks of the Rio Grande in a dory. The so-called preacher was a Grand Canyon River guide, the guests mainly professional skiers and boaters. There were sunburned, sandaled women there you wouldn't want to have to arm wrestle. Everything was laid back and behind schedule. I didn't tell any, any of my own Grand Canyon stories, like twice flipping my own raft in House Rock Rapid with different wives. But you're not going to impress the pros with that story. Before we slipped away under cover of darkness, a dazzling bride confided, we've got 10 acres down by Saw Pit. I'd like to get some bees. For those who've sucked life's marrow 
and now yearn to become wise, bees are the new frontier. Today, nothing is more intriguing, more green, more hip than keeping bees. It wasn't always so. When I started 20 years ago, it merely confirmed what some friends already suspected, but I was nuts. Well, we'd just gotten back from Taos, and already Marilyn was muttering that our getaway was too short. It was three days. Didn't I twirl her on the dance floor and take her to those hot springs by the Rio Grande she'd been dreaming about? What does she expect in the merry month of May when the bees run me ragged? A week after we got home, she announced, I have to go to Telluride Mountain Film today. Have to go? Today? This was the first I'd heard. I watched her roll down the driveway in her 99 Saturn with three OK tires and one nearly bald. Can you change a flat, I queried. I've got triple A, she called out cheerily, waving out the window. Well, keep it under 45, I shouted. She'll be back, I mused, with stories. This left me home with our blue healer dog, Pepper, and lots to do. I put him in the cab of my pickup and loaded a nuke in the back. All of a sudden, Pepper yelped and came flying out the window, madly snapping at a bee. I thought, this is crazy. Why torment the dear boy? Better to leave him home, even if he wants to come along, because he hates honeybees, and they hate him back. I headed for the Silt Mason yard. I brought empty honey supers, thinking the little darlings might be on a honey flow. But the dandelions had come and gone to seed heads, and these bees made not a dollop of honey. Now they were starving. Blame stormy weather or an inattentive beekeeper. I had six frames of honey in the truck, so I parceled them out and headed home for more. When I arrived, I was greeted by a very strange dog. He looked a lot like Pepper, but his face was bloated like some pit bull mongrel. He had a wag in his tail. I reached for his throat, and it felt like it might be swollen too, though I couldn't be sure. His lips felt like big, fat, rubbery pancakes. I called the vet, but she'd taken off for the Memorial Day weekend. I keep my own allergic reaction EpiPen, and I got it out. Then I decided not to panic. It had been a couple of hours since poor Pepper got stung, and the danger of anaphylaxis should have passed. Pepper and I went outside, and he started harassing the geese. This was a good sign. I called my neighbor Howard and said, you need to take a picture of this. Pepper growled and snapped at Howard's Australian Shepherd. Hey, I think Pepper's gonna be all right. Another hour went by. It was getting late. I put Pepper back in the house and ran back to Silt Mesa to feed the bees. He'll be fine, I kept telling myself. And of course he was. He still had the pit bull look the next day but by the morning after, he looked like Pepper again. Pepper still loves the truck, even though that's where this all started. But he stays away from my bees. He just hates them. Aw, poor Pepper. <laughs> Kim, Ed sure does a great job with those. Well, his column sounds like it reads. He goes in one direction and then and then uh, does an about face or an abrupt right turn and talks about something else, and that's one of the things that's made him popular because you're never sure what's going to come up next, and and uh, people like his style. You don't know where he's gone and where he'll end up, but it's going to be a fun journey. Yep, exactly. So thanks a lot, Ed. We appreciate that, and keep them coming. We like them. Yeah. So folks, if you you like what you hear on the show today. Uh, make sure you click on and and at, go to the top of the screen of our website and or your favorite web app and click on the subscribe or follow, whichever is presented there. And so make sure you don't miss a single episode of Beekeeping Today podcast. And you know what else, Jeff? What's that? People that are listening to this today, what do, what do, what do we know 
that somebody else should know that they that should be listening to this. So if you're listening to this today and you know somebody that should be listening to to what we're talking about, share this podcast. There's a button. Share it and send it to send the link to a friend of yours or somebody you know that needs to know about what we're talking about today, Jeff, the Honeybee Health Coalition that needs mm-hmm. to know about the Honeybee Health Coalition, more about it or something about it or at least become somewhat familiar with it. So share our podcast. And this is a great time of year to help with folks because they're starting to think about coming into beekeeping in this coming spring. They may be receiving, they, their Christmas list may include beehives or a, a nuke or a package or something. And so this is a great op, great time to start sharing. Yep, exactly. Um, good sources of information. Hey, you mentioned, quick segue, or today's show, we have Katie Savinelli from the Honey Bee Health Coalition wrapping up our Extended four-part series of programs about the coalition. We started back in March. That was way back in March with the senior project director, Matt Malika. Matt was good. He gave a good overview of how Honey Bee Health Coalition works, how it got started and where the money came from. And, and you put a whole bunch of strangers in a room and it was pretty tense to begin with. But then, but then after a while, they got to got to working together, and things began to happen, and everybody began to see the value of having something like the Honey Bee Health Coalition. The next show we did was with Dewey Karen and Mary Reed, the state inspector oh, from yeah. Texas. Uh, Dewey's always good, and and Mary was excellent on that show. And then along came came Pete Berthelsen talking about habitat. And if there's anybody that knows anything about habitat for bees, it's Pete because he knows habitat for almost everything that lives. So and that's this, a great show. This was uh, this was a, a good series, and and um, I hope folks go back and listen. Listen to all four of them at, at say you know in a row if you can, because yeah. you get the big picture. You can go out and search for those on the show. Uh, on our website or in your app of choice, or they're in the links in the show notes below. So coming up today, Katie Savinelli. Yeah, uh, and and Katie is, um, well, she's going to talk about honeybee health relative to crop protection. And you know what that means. And, and, and <laughs> you know, there's two elephants in the room when it comes to honeybee health. And one of them is varroa, and the other one is the things that farmers have to do to protect their crops that bees sometimes don't deal well with. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's a sensitive subject for many, many beekeepers. And, and uh, but it's very important. It's part of the reality. So I think it's really great that we have uh, fantastic researchers and uh, such as Katie working on protecting our pollinators and they're and, and they've they've already solved they've already they've already put together some solutions to this that farmers are being able to use the beekeepers are being able to use and it's benefiting both of them sounds good well let's get right into that talk with katie but first a quick word from our great friends at strong microbials hello beekeepers Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees digestion and improve your honeybees' response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe-to-use product. Strong Microbial's Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. Hey, everybody, welcome back. And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, the regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. (laughs) Hey, sitting across the virtual Zoom table right now is Katie Savinelli from Syngenta. She is the U.S. Stewardship Team and Pollinator Lead, and she's here representing uh, the, the fourth part of our Honeybee Health Coalition uh, series and and talking about crop and pet uh, crop pest management. Welcome to beekeeping today, Katie. Well, 
thank you for inviting me. I'm I'm was thinking about and I looked at all the other guests you've had in the past, and definitely a lot of the guests are really closely tied to beekeeping. I'm less tied to beekeeping. I do consider myself to be a beekeeper, but not a honey beekeeper because I put out a lot of uh, mason beehives and things like that. And I also wanted to share with the audience, I've, I've been an entomologist since 1977, so over 40 years. And I actually really, really like insects, including bees. I mean, they're fa completely fascinating to me. But I also want to mention that one of the reasons I got into entomology was I really think it's important that um, agriculture is part of our, um, you know, part of our DNA, so to speak. And I wanted to have that nexus between agriculture and controlling insect pests that will harm crops. And so for the rest of all the other insects, I want to keep them as healthy as possible. So that's really where I'm coming from. Oh, very good. And and the pollinators, uh, we're pollinator friendly, all pollinators friendly here on the Beekeeping Today podcast. So uh, that's fine. You don't have to be a beekeeper to be on the show. So welcome. <laughs> well, Katie, it's nice to meet you and uh, finish off this part with the Honey Bee Health Coalition. I've been waiting to... I, I, I'll say I've been waiting to fin finish this, not because I want to be done with it, but I've been wanting, waiting to listen to your part of this. Um, the Honeybee Health Coalition's doing what I consider to be a stunningly excellent job at doing what they do and keeping beekeepers informed. And and this is just another good part of what they do. So I'm glad you could join us today. And, and thank you. Thank you. And it's good to meet you as well. And, and certainly um, I've been a member of the Honeybee Health Coalition since the, the very beginning, since it was first initiated. And, I, you know, as you mentioned, I come in with a slightly different view because I come in from the crop protection and crop pest management side. But I think we need to have conversations on both sides, you know, the beekeepers as well as the agriculture people. So, so I think it's been a really good opportunity to really share views and have some interesting discussions. Sometimes we don't always agree, but that's that's I think that's part of learning. Absolutely. Well, let's step back and take a quick look at the the Honey Bee Health Coalition, their their main programs within uh, for the co uh, crop protection. They they and and maybe you can talk on each one. Um, down the road here, but they have a uh, they have the manage pollinator protection plans, and they best practices for uh, pesticide uh, for growers and beekeepers, and uh, also they've developed an incident reporting system. Um, so those are, those are a couple of the big big three areas of the Honey Bee Health Coalition's programs. Uh, let's let's start with um, some of the how are the pesticides and practices changed over the years uh, for beekeepers and and for growers and beekeepers. Well, do you want me to? I was thinking about talking specifically about each program that you Certainly. brought up and, and clarifying. So the MP3, the Managed Pollinator Protection Plans, mm -hmm. are actually um, developed by the states. So each state was given the task from EPA to come up with their own plan. And the plan really is about how do beekeepers and farmers and even homeowners in some states, how do they communicate with one another and really understand where the bees are as well as the pesticide practices. So that's really a state-run um, um, program. And But the Honey Bee Health Coalition has been involved as far as you know some of the earlier conversations around that. So that's one that they don't necessarily own, but they're certainly part of that. Um, the best management practices, this is where I really have had an active role in the best management practices. So the thought around this is how do you have farmers use pesticides, but at the same time not cause harm to bees? Now, for some viewers, not viewers, but listeners are probably thinking, how, how is that possible? Because we know pesticides, and I'm speaking about insecticides right now, they're designed to harm insects. I mean, that's really how they are. But um, we believe, and this is a Syngenta view, that if you use the insecticides according to the label, because the labels are designed to say, okay, we're going to not use them during the time when the pollinators are active. So for instance, in a lot of the foliar applications, we say don't use when the bees are actively foraging, or we'll even have on our labels, it says don't spray them at all during flowering. So we kind of avoid that time when the bees are out. So these, these, but these best management practices are, you know, certainly there's a lot of information on the label and we hope everyone reads the label, 
But what the Honeybee Health Coalition has done is saying, okay, let's look at a number of different crops and let's look at each crop during certain times of the growing season, as well as what the bees are doing, you know, relative to that crop. And in some cases, like in the case of canola, canola is a very important crop for bees and especially honeybees. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about corn, not so much. However, there are some concerns with corn during planting season, you know, with the potential dust to uh, migrate over to where the bees are. And so that's, you know, so when we're looking at each crop a little bit differently, depending on how it's used, which products are used, and then, you know, what are some of the best ways to uh, mitigate any potential problems? And I can get into a lot more details if you want me to. I can talk about some other programs, but that's kind of the, the overall view. And then let's, I'm, I'm going to go back to the incident reporting, and then we can get into more questions. Sure. So the incident reporting is actually something that um, both the, the states have incident reporting. So if there is a bee kill, they have to go to the state. Usually it's the State Department of Agriculture, and it may depend on the state too, but they have to report it to the state. And then it, then it, you know, and I live in North Carolina, and I'm really lucky to live in North Carolina because we have a very strong apiary inspector program who also will go out and inspect if there's any problems. You know, and a lot of times it could be either the bees aren't being fed properly or there's diseases. It's not always pesticides, but they will go out and they know how to sample and really look at that. So the incident reporting that the Honeybee Health Coalition is really trying to say, okay, beekeepers. If you do have an incident, here's kind of like the simple way to report it so that the information does get collected. And as a registrant, we call ourselves registrants, we think that's very important because if there are, you know, bee kills or potential bee kills, we want to know about it too. Because if we have to make adjustments on the label, we can do that. But if we don't have the information, you know, we're sort of living in a in a vacuum. So I think it's really important to really for the for for the beekeepers to report any incidents, but also to work through their state apiary inspectors if they have them, because they're really the first line of defense as well as the experts. Well, I can, I can see where the beekeeper would be. Um, what's the word I want? The role of state inspectors is the biggest variable you have there because some states have none. Some states have just, you know, very, I'm not going to say inactive, but there's one inspector for the whole state. So they're stretched a mile thin. Um, so I can see where that role might might not work well everywhere. Right. If that's the case, if I don't have a state inspector or one who will, who can come and look, what what's what what happens then? Um, and this is part of that incident reporting. You can also report to the EPA, and so now you're going to a much higher level. But the EPA will actually gather all of the information, and it's it's anonymous. But they also use that. So, for instance, if we go through re-registration, they'll look at all of these reports and um, they call them six eight twos. But they're basically it's a, it's a use that happened, but you know you had an adverse effect, and so they'll they'll look at that as well. But I think that's also important. But you know, typically, if you have a state apiarist, it's best to go through them because they're the you know they're really the experts. Yeah. Right? Well, I can see that that. From a beekeeper's perspective, an incident report is something you really want to pursue because once you have an incident, then it can be examined and the situation that led up to it can be reversed or at least reduced. Um, so from a beekeeper's perspective, these are these would be really important. Yeah, and the timing is critical because if there is an incident and you know a lot of times they will take samples and send them off to you know official labs to have them sample to see you know what's what to be ingested but if you wait a few days then you know you've, you've lost precious time so the timing's really critical and some some will even um freeze the bees so in other words they they take them and collect them yeah so so it is but the timing's really critical and then the other thing and I know and I know in talking to beekeepers and everything is you know, you go into these big ag agricultural areas where you may be, and I use almonds as an example, and, you know, this is in California. So th I think the almond growers have done a, an amazing job in, you know, ensuring that products are used so that they're not harming bees. So in other words, even if there's a night application, but it's typically if it has a um, toxicity that allows the, them to use it. But otherwise, like I said, our products, we say don't spray them. But anyway, the bottom line is, if you're in a big agricultural situation, you may have something that happens in a field, I don't know, 
you know, a mile away or something. And so it's not really in that place where the honeybees are. It could be, you know, further away because they might be foraging somewhere else. So that's where it gets a little tricky is trying to understand the source of the um, pesticide poisoning. Better Bee is pleased to sponsor today's episode of Beekeeping Today podcast. For over 40 years, Better Bee has supplied beekeepers across the country with the tools, equipment, and knowledge needed to succeed. Because many Better Bee employees are beekeepers themselves, they understand your needs and challenges and are better prepared to answer your beekeeping questions. From their colorful catalog to their support of beekeeper educational activities, including this podcast, Better Bee truly lives up to their tagline of beekeepers serving beekeepers. See for yourself at betterbee.com. Well, before we get much further, or go into the next question, can you restate for us the, 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 what is a neonic and what is the neonic problem? What, what, what's the issue at hand? So a neonic is an insecticide. And when the neonics were registered, um, some of the uh, benefits of the neonics is that they're generally less harmful to workers. So in other words, it, you know, from a human exposure, less of a problem. But at the same time, they are insecticides. So they are, you know, highly toxic to bees. And so that's definitely a concern. But I also want to state that the neonics tend to be very specific in what they control. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you look at some of the older chemistry, they're more broad spectrum. So in other words, they control lots of different taxa, whereas the neonics are really good on what we call sucking insects. So things like aphids, things like um, Colorado, Colorado potato beetles, which are more chewing insects, but they're not very active on, let's say, lepidopterans, which are butterflies and that type of thing, but they are highly toxic to bees. And so that's why we have very specific language. And I think part of what's considered to be the problem is because they're so toxic to bees, then in some cases, you know, we're accused of, you know, killing all the bees. And I, I don't think that's the case. I think it's really, it's just a misunderstanding of the products. And, you know, and as I, as I want to remind everybody, insecticides are designed to kill insects. But in the case of neonics, and because they're selective, things like ladybugs, they don't harm. There's this uh, bug called the big-eyed bug, which is a really good predator. They're not harmed. So in other words, they're actually softer on a lot of what we call beneficial insects than some other products. And so, you know, there's there's good and bad, but I think sometimes the bad gets emphasized without considering, you know, how they're um how they're good. And you know, and we we did a pretty extensive study a few years ago. We we hired a um ag informatics, which was a, a group of university people. And and one of the questions was what would what would the world look like if neonics were no longer available? And if you think about it, I mean a lot of people think, well if, if you don't use neonics, then you don't, you know, it's not really controlling insects, but Europe is a good place where they, uh, you know, I don't want to say they banned, but, you know, they're, they're not using neonics. And after one year, they started having some insect problems that they didn't have, and then they were spraying more. And so assuming that the insect problems are not going to go away in agriculture, you then start replacing neonics with older chemistry, and you also actually add more pounds of active ingredient to the environment. So you know, there's always this balance between what we're trying to control versus what we're trying to um, benefit. And I think sometimes, you know, we lose sight of that and everyone thinks just get rid of a certain class of insecticides and everything will go back. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's that, that way at all. Real good. all right. And I'm, I'm serious about this, you know, because I, I've studied it and everything and I don't want, I don't want to harm insects and, and duly. And can I just share a personal story? Certainly. Um, so, you know, one of the other reasons why I got into agriculture was my grandfather who immigrated, emigrated from Italy. So my grandfather was Italian, but he became an American citizen. And his his dream was to have an orange grove. So he, he had an orange grove in Florida. So I went down there as a child and I was just like completely enamored with everything about agriculture and seeing all these things. But, you know, back in the day when my grandfather had his orange grove, they really didn't have that many pests. And so when they were controlling insects or mites or, or scales, they pretty much used oil. And, and, you know, most people would think oil, you know, they think their oil is not bad, but, you know, oil is actually, it's pretty broad spectrum. But I mean, that was really what they were using and they weren't using a lot. But, but we had the Asian citrus psyllid come in and that insect by itself is not that bad. However, it does transmit a disease. And the problem with 
the disease is once it gets inside the tree, it basically shortens the life of the citrus tree. And so instead of getting 50 or 75 years of a citrus tree, now you're 15. And so the farm, you know, the citrus growers are having to replant trees more often and spray a lot more than they did. And so that's that's been, to me, a real tragedy with some of these invasive pests. And we kind of lose sight of that sometimes as these new pests come in, they take over and the farmers are really left with very few tools that they can use to really control them. And in some cases, they're really trying hard just to stay in business. Yeah. Regarding the pesticide poisoning, one of the things that's often mentioned to us uh, by guests are the synergistic effects of the pesticide with a surfactant or uh, anything else that's mixed in the tank. It, it, is there any research that's starting? I mean, I know the variables would be unmeasurable but is there any is there any research that is centering on any of the synergistic effects yeah and i'm kind of smiling because i'm thinking how granular do you want me to be i can (laughs) i can get i'm gonna try to be you know simple but let me let me just explain a couple of things and i hope it makes sense and if it doesn't um you can cut this part out but um (laughs) you know a lot of times so bees are like all organisms they have these genes that allow them to break down, you know, toxins. And it's not just toxins from pesticides, it's, you know, it's other toxins. And, and you know, a lot of people think that bees don't have these, you know, they call them cytochrome P450s, but they don't believe they have them, but they actually do. So, so in some cases, there are, and I'll, I'll give you the real examples because this is documented. In some cases, there are examples where if you have, let's say, a trials, triazole fungicide and a pyrethroid insecticide, but remember, they have to be in the tank together. You can't spray one one week and something two weeks later, because to me, that's not the same because they're separated. But they ha- that has been documented to have synergy. So yes, there is synergy in that case. But I think sometimes people will take the word synergy and maybe overuse it. Mm-hmm. And 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 I'm saying this with with conviction. And the reason why I'm saying this is that um, we actually um, we we Syngenta is working with a university cooperator who went through all of the papers that were claiming synergy, and you know what they found was it was like pyrethroids and triazoles, which we already knew. But you know a lot of times they say, well, it's this and that and something else, and more often than not, it's not. And it's really how they do the study the number of treatments that they do, how they measure it. it. This is a really kind of a fine, fine work. And my favorite study came out of North Carolina State University where they were actually looking at some, so there's some synergists, there's some products that actually will be added to, let's say, pyrethroids to make them more active. So they're taking known synergists and adding them. And in the lab, they actually saw synergy. But when they took it to the field, they weren't seeing that. So I think the other thing that I'm always careful when I look at um, studies, I, I say, okay, is it a lab study? Is it a field study? Is it a complementary work? Because otherwise, sometimes a lab study is the worst case or, you know, maybe the exposure is too high. So um, synergy is definitely something out there. But I think sometimes everyone thinks everything's synergistic and it's not the case. It's a it's a catchword. It's a catchword. And, and you know, we're, we're even... Um, you know, we, you know, we have mixtures and sometimes people think synergy, but synergy is one plus one equals three or four. It's not one plus one equals two. That's additive. And so that's different than synergy. But we, there will be a paper published oh, maybe this year, maybe early next year that really, you know, delves into that. And the person that we hired to do the work, I mean, you know, he, we provided him the studies. He looked at all the work and he came up with his conclusions. We weren't you know, monitoring what he was doing other than when he was, you know, writing the paper. But so he'll have a paper published later on, maybe late this year. I think he submitted it. So I think that'll help. Um, You also had a question about adjuvants. Um, Not all adjuvants are the same. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that they've said the silicon, I think the silicon dioxide has some effects and there, you know, there have been some proven studies with that. But just because someone's putting an adjuvant doesn't mean it automatically creates synergy. A lot of times when they use adjuvants, and we, we don't use as many adjuvants with insecticides per se, because, you know, when we develop formulations, they're formulated in such a way so that, you know, for us, it's about covering the plant surface. Mm-hmm. 
if it's necessary, it may be helped to penetrate. So really those are things that are you know, unique to the formulation. So sometimes they'll add some of these adjuvants or they or we can't formulate them, so we do that. But I think, I know that there's going to be a lot more talk about adjuvants. I, I, I just saw something the other day, someone saying they're not regulated. But I also think it goes back to the, some of those lab studies when people looked at adjuvants and they haven't necessarily had the same rate that they would use in the tank. Okay. So, yeah. And, and a lot of times they use adjuvants for drift management too. So, and to me, drift management is really important because you want to keep the product on the field. Yeah. So. Yeah. One of the things that the uh, coalition is doing is producing um, best management practices for both beekeepers and, and applicators. And um, according to your webpage, yeah, I see you've got soy, corn, and canola, best management practices. You're about ready to release one for apples, I hope, by next spring. Um, if I wanted one of those, where can I get it? If I wanted one of those best management practices so I can go to my grower yeah. or a grower can go to a beekeeper and say, here's what the Honey Bee Health Coalition is recommending. Okay. So you go to the Honey Bee Health Coalition website and there's downloadable resources and they have those best management practices. My only watch out, I think there was one, I was looking at it yesterday. There is a presentation that kind of summarizes it. But some of these best management practices are about 26 pages or 20 plus pages. And I think sometimes you need to have a little, um, like a little simpler for some people because they don't necessarily want to read all 20 pages. And um, the one thing I want to just bring up and, and you know, it's, I'm going to be selfless promoting, but um, Syngenta, along with the other registrants, and it goes beyond Neonex, we've come up with a um, pollinator stewardship. It's like a, it's a, Bifold, um, and it has some really common practices. And so, in other words, and I'm just going to name them. And I think sometimes if you just start off with the simple area first, and then let people delve into it. So, some of the things that we say, and and this goes across Honeybee Health Coalition, is first of all, read the label. Read the label is really important. There's really good information. I used to write labels in my previous jobs. So that's number one. Also, know the toxicity of the product. So, if you have a insecticide that's highly toxic to bees, you will have label language that say don't spray during flowering. So that's understand the toxicity. Um, it's also understanding bee habits because, you know, as as has been put in a lot of different literature, honeybees are only out during certain parts of the day. And so later in the day when it starts getting dark, you know, some people are spraying then, some people are spraying earlier in the morning when the honeybees are less active. So that's that's important communicating with your beekeepers you know a lot of the farmers that i work with they work with the beekeepers they know where they know the beekeepers in their area and they'll even say okay if you're going to put the hives on my farm please put it behind these trees because that's like a windbreak and so therefore you won't have the drift so that's also really important is communicating and then also know some of the local local laws because you know sometimes you know some states and even some counties have some differences so I think some of those, and I'm just trying to think, um, and, you know, drift, as I mentioned before, drift management is very important. And then also sea treatment. So to me, sea treatment is one area that, and this is neonic sea treatments. And we have, and I'm going to another time, Syngenta and the other registrants have been working with this Growing Matters Coalition. And the Growing Matters Coalition has been promoted by Honeybee Health Coalition. But we have a, um, what we call the Be Shore with an exclamation mark every year. And our whole idea is that we have it, we have like different blurbs, social media, PSAs, interviews, et cetera. And we're trying to really remind farmers during Planting season, be really careful about dust. And then during application, foliar applications, think about drift. But the dust part is important because um, farmers can use different types of equipment that pushes the dust into the ground. And it's the dust that comes off the um, planter, as well as using some different lubricants. So for us, dust mitigation is very important. Hmm. A, a quick question on, on um, crops. I mentioned apples and so, uh, soy, soybeans, corn. And I'm going to bet that that corn is aimed more at sweet corn as a commercial crop than um, field corn. Um, it's actually both. It's it's actually for both for in the, in these particular um recommendations. And I think I think okay. I think it's the dust 
And and let me let me just bring up what I think is an important point. And I think um, your listeners need to understand this is that you know you know I, and I've been working on I've been doing this for a long time, a long time. And um, I know when we were starting to really think more about honeybees because you know the studies we used to do on honeybees were really on the adults, so we knew the adult activity. Now we do larval studies and that type of thing, so we have a much better understanding, you know, where we have some potential problems. The other thing that we've done as an industry, and it's been pretty comprehensive and pretty extensive, is that we've done what we call pollen and nectar studies. And so we've gone across many, 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 many crops, including corn, which only has pollen, no nectar, as well as soybean. And you could imagine trying to get nectar out of a little soybean flower because they're kind of small. And sometimes you get the pollen contamination. So it's kind of tricky. But we've done very extensive pollen and nectar studies with seed treatments. And according to EPA, and you can find this on their website as well as their evaluations, um, seed treatments pose a very low risk, very low risk. Now, you're, you'll probably say, well, low risk means there's some risk. But keep in mind from an EPA's point of view, there's no such thing as no risk. So low risk is as good as it gets. And so from a pollen and nectar point of view, which is typically later in the season from when they use seed treatments, it's a very low risk to the honeybees. But dust is an area that we definitely have concerns about and we continue to say, please, you know, please be careful with the dust or at least make sure that the bee, bees are not close by when you're planting corn. I, I can tell you just right off the top, I spent three summers working at the USDA Bee Lab in Madison, Wisconsin. And for three summers, I sucked nectar out of soybean flowers <laughs> all summer long. <laughs> so I, I appreciate the fact of how, how difficult that can be. Are you looking at adding, you said you're going to add apples to um, these BMPs. Are you looking at any other crops? Well, I haven't heard of any other crops because, you know, when, when we do these BMPs, it's a pretty extensive, um, it takes a lot of time because, you know, you want to get a lot of experts. So you want to have people that are experts in the crops and, you know, the whole phenology of the cropping system. You want to also understand, you know, what they're using in terms of or times when it's most problematic. And so that, that has to be done. So, and when you think about apples, Western apples are a lot different than Eastern apples in terms of pests and even how they use products. So I think this, this one's going to take a little bit of time. I think I haven't seen the first draft, but I also think you could probably apply this to um, things like pears because, you know, pears and apples are both home fruit. So, yeah, yeah. But de definitely, I would say without hesitation, the majority of the insecticide labels say do not apply during flowering. So at least you're avoiding that which is great, which is great. And, you know, I, I say it at all the meetings because we're highly toxic. And so I think that's that's probably your best thing to do is just avoid spraying Do or do not. We say do not, which in EPAs, if, if farmers do spray an insecticide during flowering, they've actually broken the law when it says not to. Yep. Yep. It is very important to follow the label, not only I mean, people laugh when you say that, but it's there's a reason why it's in the label. And and you as a label writer, <laughs> you, you, you know why it's there. Yeah. And when I first took the job, well, my previous job, um, I took it and I think within the first two weeks, maybe we didn't have the language explicit enough and uh, maybe we hadn't you know, explained it, but we actually had a bee kill. And it was, I do not like bee kills. It really ruins everything for me because I don't want to, it's not that I want to deal with it, but I really feel bad because, you know, of all the work we do. And so we really, we even got down to the point where we were saying very specific timing, you know, petal fall, well, you know, the pink stage or, you know, early pink or whatever. So it was very specific because sometimes some of the labels say, well, five days before petal fall or petal. And they're like, well, I don't really know when that's going to be because sometimes it happens like in a couple of days, right? So we, we try to be very careful in the language. But I think also, unless you have early season pests, so for instance, um, one of our products controls aphids and it's probably the only product that does a really good job on these aphids, but they're really mainly in New York. Um, that one, they do early season, but usually it's really like when their twigs are out and there's hardly any flower or even, you know, buds. So that's, that's good. But I mean, typically a lot of the insects we're trying to control are after flowering anyway, which is, which is important. One of the other things I was wondering about and, and um, 
I'm, I'm listening to you kind of kind of uh, address it a little bit and you mentioned dust and 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 with those come the the term the neonics and the dust is the problem um, for beekeepers I guess the biggest problem so uh, the the options a farmer has is hope it rains uh, in terms of controlling dust well as I mentioned, there's there's a couple of things. They have newer equipment now that has, you know, a lot of times people think when you see the the tractor going through the field, what's behind it is the neonics. It's no, it's actually they have what they call these vacuum planters. That, so they used to have what they call finger pickups. Do you remember those where there was like they picked up individual seeds? Now it's like a giant vacuum. And as the vacuum is going through, and depending on the lubricant, it may actually abrade or, or you know cause dust to form. And so before they used to have the equipment, there's this one spot that went straight up in the air. And that's not that's not an ideal state. But if you have it going down into the ground, much better. Some have hooded, um, you know, they have like these, like, it's almost like curtains that go around, but really you want to mitigate the dust as much as possible. There are some lubricants that are less dust causing problems. And, and people know about them, but you know, that's that's what we really promote. Or, you know, the best thing is if the bees can be staged further away during, you know, because corn planting takes about what two weeks, maybe, you know, when it when it happens, it happens quickly. So if they can keep the bees a little bit out of harm during that corn planting season, once that's um, done, then it's less less hazardous. And we're more worried about corn than soybeans, but we're certainly, you know, soybeans could be an issue as well. But corn's definitely more of an issue. And I, I do want to say that as a as a company and as other, um, you know, seed treatment providers, we do a lot, a lot of testing for dust. And so when we're, they call it a recipe. So they actually have the active ingredient and then they have all the coatings that go on the seed. And we will go through various tests to make sure that it, the dust off from that formulation is not a problem. And we use the European standards because the U.S. doesn't really have any standards and the European standards are very strict. And so we we look at that. We look at cold temperatures, warm temperatures, different equipment and everything. So we do a very extensive testing just to make sure that we're not potentially putting a product out there. But, you know, once it gets into the planter, there's always that that's chance. And, you know, we're hoping that as things progress, they're using more of these modern planters. One of the other things that you're uh, involved in with the uh, coalition is is enhancing nutrition. I like that phrase a lot, enhancing nutrition. So where's your role? in? And I mean, what they're talking about is farmers planting f additional forage for bees. Okay. <laughs> for, for a moment, I was like, please don't ask me about bee nutrition because okay. I am not an expert. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes, of course. Um, this, so I always tell people, you know, I, I have different parts of my job and I have been very lucky to work with a number of different groups, um, planting forage and habitat. And so what, one of the groups we work with, and I think you had Pete Berthelsen mm -hmm. speak for the, yeah. So Pete, Pete and I have gone back a long way and we certainly support his organization, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund to plant for, you know, plant flowers outside of the area where the you know farming is and it's farmland that they wouldn't be farming anyway which i think is great we've actually worked with a number of um potato growers who have those four corners you know when they do the center pivot irrigation and they can plant forage and habitat there and and so one question is well isn't aren't the pesticides reaching that and generally no because the way they're applying them it's very precise and so that's been a lot of fun and yeah, wherever we can plant forage and habitat, to me, that's like, let's, let's do it. Yeah, it's really important. And it helps, it helps not only the honeybees, but it also helps monarch butterflies, native bees, and that type of thing. And, you know, certainly when I started, you know, thinking about honeybees, that's really what I was focusing on. But as I evolved over the last few years, I started thinking, you know, you plant and you get lots of bees, you know, it's not just, you know, one type of bee. And I think sometimes even with monarch butterflies, people think, oh, you plant these flowers and then you just have monarchs. No, you have, <laughs> you have a lot of other insects too, besides butterflies. But I mean, it's kind of fun to see all the different insects and see how they're all really doing well. And I, I love that. I mean, as an entomologist who wants to see insects everywhere, it's really, it's, it's fun for me. And and I'll tell you I'll tell you one quick story. Sure. I'll tell you one quick story. My my um town has a um, they just bought a farm, 
and they had this milkweed patch and I, and it's a lovely milkweed patch. And so I wrote to them earlier this year and I said, please, please, please do not cut down that milkweed patch like you do every year. And apparently the farmer didn't even know he wasn't paying attention. And so the town allowed the milkweed to stay. And so that was oh. just great. So I think we all can do something even at the local level. It all starts there. And Pete gets up in the morning looking for- Hot, looking for ways to provide more habitat, and you're just backing them up there with providing nutrition. So hand in hand, it should be working pretty well. I think so. Yeah, I hope so. But we could all do more, right? We're not there yet. Well, real good. So, Katie, this has been great fun having you here. Is there anything that you'd like to mention that we haven't asked you about yet? Sure. Um, I, I really, you know, I, I have a great deal of respect for beekeepers mm -hmm. because I know it's a hard job. I know it's a lot of work to keep the bees healthy. I, I, I really have a lot of respect, which is probably why I'm not a beekeeper. But I also um, want to just always remind ourselves that, you know, the bees are part of, in, in a lot of cases, part of the agricultural landscape. And we have to find a way to have a balance between the bee health as well as the farmers and what they need to do. And if we can get to that place, I think we're in a really much better place. And I think part of it's just really trying to understand and communicate with one another. And I think there's a lot of farmers and beekeepers that, that already have this relationship. And I think it would be best for us to continue promoting some of the cooperation that takes place. I think that's a good word to end on. Good point. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Well, Katie, it's been, as I said, great pleasure having you on the show. Thank, Thank you, you for representing Honeybee Health Coalition and all the great work that they're doing. And uh, we look forward to possibility having you back. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> Katie, thank you for being here. Um, I learned some things, and I hope our listeners did. And um, good luck in keeping doing what you're doing. Well, thank you. I, I certainly enjoy it. It's, it's my passion. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. You know, I was a little concerned uh, as a beekeeper having someone on the, the podcast uh, talking about chemicals and application of chemicals and the benefit of chemicals uh, on crops. But when you th sit back and think about uh, the dependency our food system has on chemicals, uh, you can't separate them anymore. You, you can't go back. Well, the Honey Bee Health Coalition people knew that right at the beginning. And, mm -hmm. and they made it a point to have those people sit at the table um, because if you're not at the table, you can't talk. And that's what, yeah. that's, as she said, that's what, as Katie said, that's what we need is we need more opportunities for, for exchanging ideas and, and, uh, uh, solving problems. So I think what we did today is part of that, what the Honeybee Health Coalition is doing, uh, certainly is leading the way. And we only got one planet and we only got a short time to be here. So uh, we've got to learn to live, get along. Yeah, absolutely. And it just get, kept me thinking about, I think it was maybe Jerry Hayes or maybe, I can't remember who it said, but that very first meeting in the Honey Bee Health Coalition, we had of all these despair, different groups representing at the table, probably sitting there yeah. with their arms folded. Yep. You know, I'm not going to talk to that person. I'm not going to talk with that person, but here they are. Uh, several years later and, and making great progress and doing great things for bees and, and You're gonna for agriculture. You're going to have the uh, information for the uh, <clears throat> Honey Bee Health Coalition contacts uh, on the webpage? Always. Good. Yep, Good. yep. And, and, and links to the other episodes uh, in this series. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of the Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We want to thank Strong Microbials for their support of the podcast. Check out their full probiotic line at www.globalpatties.com strongmicrobials.com. We want to thank Better Bee for joining us. Check out their full line of beekeeping supplies at www.betterbee.com. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kim? I think that about wraps it up, Jeff. All right. Thanks a lot, Kim. 
Take care. Thanks a lot, everybody.